everyone. Uh, I'll assume you can see my slides. Yes. Um, all right, good stuff. Um, so yeah, thank you, Mike, and uh, the rest of the team for sort of organizing this seminar series. Um, and so I'll talk today about Sagittarius A star and the Galactic Center, um, uh, the work we hope to do with Access, and the thoughts we've been having in the Compact Object and Supernova Remnant Working Group. And this is work that myself and uh, Mel Ninka at MIT have been leading. Um, so the background image here is basically uh, the picture book motivation for why we want to study this region. Um, it's a composite of the recent Meerkat uh, uh, release, and that's mostly in red, and then X-ray in the background. And so, you know, by eye, there's lots of correlations between things here. And there's a uh, structure on all scales from the things we know, like point sources, to then the more familiar extended objects we know of, uh, like supernova remnants, pulsar wind nebulae, to then more extreme linear features here that are much less well understood and are telling us something about the large scale plasma dynamics um, in the galactic center. And these features are a unique feature of the galactic center. And so they're telling us something about how extreme that environment is. Um, okay, let's see. All right. Um, thinking more than about X-rays, uh, one of the prime reasons we're interested in the Galactic Center, of course, is because uh, it's the location of Sagittarius A star, which is uh, the nearest supermassive black hole. Um, there are also many other objects. So here, this is a two to eight kV Chandra um, exposure. And you can see um, various things indicated. So there are things like Sagittarius A East and the B complex, which are massive star forming regions. You have non thermal filaments um, in the central region, which you can't see here on this scale. There are things like magnetars, extra binaries, and Sagittarius A star. Um, on larger scales, then you're able to see the uh, molecular clouds, which are illuminated by the X-ray plasma and fluoresce. Uh, one of the things that we should emphasize here um, is when looking at this Chandra data is the importance of spatial resolution. And that is something that Axis brings to the table. And then also something you can see here is sort of when you move out beyond where the text labels are, um, you can by eye see the PSF starting to noticeably degrade. And that is something that Axis will not have. Um, and so we will be able to do images of complicated regions with dense source populations like this uh, in a way that has previously not been possible. Um, just to orientate everyone a little bit more regarding the the very center of the galaxy. Um, and this is a nice plot put together by um, Genzo in a review last year. Um, so the bottom axis then is in, in parsecs, uh, radially away from Sagittarius A star, and you have gravitational units for the black hole on the top axis. Um, there's an arrow here on the bottom marking the G2 orbit. Uh, G2 gets into about 120 AU away from Sagittarius A star. And then there are various lines depicting the stellar populations. Um, theoretical predictions for populations of black holes that will uh, lie in the uh, mass segregate towards the inner region. Um, and then the separate sort of uh, S star and stellar disks that are specific to the galactic center. Um, for axis, the scale kind of that we're interested in is somewhere out around 0.2 parsecs here. That's giving us one arc second. So that would be say two of our pixels. Um, and that will you know allow us to start studying um, interesting things. So you're getting all the way out to somewhere around four to five arc seconds for the black hole sphere of influence. And so this is where the Bondi flow will um, take over from the stellar mass that is feeding it uh, in, the, in the outer um, regions beyond that. Um, so the main uh, target and science objective that sort of we think of when we think of the galactic center is the black hole, the supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star. So I'll spend a lot of my time talking about that. Um, 
uh, as the title slide showed, there's science here for all interests, though it's an incredibly exciting region of the sky. Um, so Sagittarius A star is a low luminosity AGN um, at about 10 to the minus 9 Eddington. Uh, this is the mode in which the vast majority of black holes in the universe exist. And so it's a fundamentally interesting case to study. Uh, and it's telling us about very low luminosity accretion. Uh, the black hole mass has been measured from stellar dynamics. And the accretion rate that we need into that inner region is only about 10 to the minus 7 solar masses. And so that's readily available from winds from the stellar population in that region. Um, the spectral energy distribution can be uh, fit. And so from radio to the X-ray, and you can then gain constraints on things like the magnetic field um, and the densities um, in uh, that flow. One of the sort of interesting areas then that AXIS can contribute to is to looking at this quiescent emission. And these are some of the um, most interesting results that Chandra has uh, generated from its studies of the, at the center of the galaxy. Um, so you can see here on the left, and, and this is all from uh, Wang 2013, where uh, depicted uh, in the blue circle is that spatial scale um, of sort of four arc seconds-ish where the Bondi uh, flow should take over. Specifically, then, when you look at the sort of brighter emission around Sagittarius A star, you start noticing a couple of interesting things, sort of on the far uh, right here. The sort of point emission is consistent with the Chandra PSF, but there is a spatial extent off of that that has a shape. And that shape is um, extended in the direction of where the stellar disk is known to be extended. Um, you can see here that uh, we're seeing the photon noise directly in this image. Um, and this is with, you know, three megaseconds of Chandra. And after the flaring was removed, I believe it's about 2.5 kiloseconds of good time here. And so Axis increases in an effective area will allow it to really um, improve on, on this science over the life of the mission. And the types of things you can start being interested in are you know, the structure and morphology of these regions and what that's telling you about the directionality of inflows into the Bondi flow. Um, and then how objects such as, for example, the S stars and these G objects that are also known might imprint dynamical signatures on the flow. Um, just to emphasize then the importance of uh, spatial resolution, um, this is the sort of unbinned Chandra data that was used in, to generate those plots on the previous slide. Um, so a number of radii are denoted here. So you have the inner um, accretion flow, these, this ADAF, REF type flow, and that's on about 1.5 arc second scales. The Bondi flow, um, it's more thermal, extends beyond that. And then we think of the stellar flux uh, that is feeding this region out here. So there's, you know, this long linear feature in the square box, that's a known, um, I think, uh, pulsar supernova remnant. Um, and it's got a tail that has to be resolved and excluded. And then there are all of these point sources which have to be resolved and excluded if you were to do this study correctly. Um, what I think is immediately uh, clear by eye to any of us is that um, how bad the human mind is at doing uh, statistical detections of point sources, because our eyes would tell us that there are a number of regions in this image that look kind of like sources. Why are they not? And this is in the Chandra data. They're just below the detection significance at this depth. This is, it again, an area now where um, Axis can go deeper, find more of these sources, and by doing that, then reduce the error bars on the resulting constraints on things like the density profile of the um, accretion flow. And that's what's plotted here in these two spectra. So it's a phenomenological plot on the left, and then the uh, more physical model on the right. And from this model, 
what you can say is that you get a flat density profile. And this flat density profile is what you expect from uh, ADAF, REF type flow where much of the mass is ejected. Uh, the formal constraint that Chandra could make is that the no outflow solution um, is uh, it rejected at um, a high level of confidence. Uh, the basic constraint here on the density profile is a one sigma 30% error. And so that's something that can be improved on by quite a lot by access observations. Um, of interest then, uh, the uh, grading data that was taken along with this um, imaging study has been analyzed recently. And that suggested the presence of relatively cool plasma um, in the nuclear region. And the sort of most natural place to expect that is out near the Bondi radius. And again, sort of deep axis imaging will have the ability to really sort of probe that spatial scale and get enough photons to do this science. Um, so in addition to the quiescent emission, we have then the flaring component. And Perhaps then there, there is an argument that if you're really interested in studying black hole physics and the relativistic plasma physics, that it is during these flares that the most interesting phenomenology occurs. Um, the cumulative plots here give you an idea of the uh, distribution of flares. Um, and this is work done by primarily by Joey Nielsen as, as part of the long term or the large Chandra program. And the, the flare distribution has two broad components. There's a sort of fainter Poisson-like component, and then a, the flares have a power law-like uh, distribution. Um, the upper end of this distribution uh, is uncertain, and that is sort of depicted by the log normal fit in the, in the lower panel. And that is in the same sense as, um, I guess uh, Mary kind of suggested this a little bit in the previous talk. The you know area on the sky you've looked at allows you to find the brightest AGN and quasars. And for looking at flares, it's the time on Sagittarius A star is the limiting factor. And so that, that creates the limit there. Um, an interesting thing that has been seen is that when we look at say swift long-term monitoring of, of the galactic center, and there's been suggestions from Chandra monitoring as well, is that the uh, flaring rate from Sagittarius A star, which is roughly one sort of by eye characterizable and identifiable as a flare per day, um, that is, changed, has, is changing and has changed over time. And sort of the time intervals indicated you know, one of the ideas then that people are interested in is, is it the, you know, pericenter passage of G2, which excited us all around the 2012 period, um, or some of the other dynamical objects moving around in the um, accretion flow? Are these objects creating things like shocks and wakes that are um, increasing or decreasing the mass flow onto the black hole? I think these are all areas that axes can look to, to make an impact. Um, sort of more specifically then, if we just think about the flares themselves, um, you have uh, the plot here on the right is showing uh, Chandra observation um, with the observing gaps removed. And so this is going out to uh, beyond a megasecond. Um, and so you can see by eye a large number of flares. And then there's, you know, if you follow these dotted red lines, there's a few of them that are starting to get down towards the noise that we have to work statistically to identify. But typically you're looking at one a day of these things that you can just pull out. Um, we can do, we can fit these. And so the plots on the left are showing um, radio and, and X-ray monitoring that was uh, produced by uh, Ponty back in 2017. And that's allowing you to then fit a model that's consistent with say, a, a synchrotron emission with a break um, somewhere in the uh, uh, above the optical. Um, of interest, then we can sort of stack the spectra of the flares and get a, a power line index of about 2.4. Um, and then we can 
sort of identify two populations of flares. So there are weaker flares that are about 10 times quiescence, and then there are strong flares that are about 100 times the quiescent level. And these 100 times quiescent flares, these are the things that happen about once a day. There are rarer still flares that go up to um, much higher flux levels to 1,000 or 10,000 times. And only a few of them have been seen during the lifetime of, say, Chandra and XML observations at the galactic center. Um, we're, this is an area that's fundamentally um, now a multi-wavelength endeavor. And you know we've had exciting new capabilities coming online in the last decade. And this is a, a study um, from last year or a couple of years ago now where gravity has come online. And with uh, Alma Spitzer and Chandra and Newstar, um, they detected a flare. And, and this is one of the areas now that uh, will be interesting um, in the future, because uh, you can see here on the bottom, very frustratingly, but uh, this is how life works, that when this flare happened, Alma had, had a gap. Um, Axis, due to its flexibility, will be an instrument that can be used in a manner that um, the le lower level of constraints, I think, will allow us to carry out more interesting observing strategies to um, coordinate with other facilities. But anyway, if we, if we look here, so you can see um, from the gravity, so a measurements which are sort of K-band, you have Spitzer, uh, a little bit longer than that, and then with Chandra, and so you fit this data, and again, you can fit it with a synchrotron model with cooling break, um, or you can do self synchrotron self-Compton. The variations then are telling us that maybe there's a time variable cutoff. Now, that's the model that's outlined here with this data set, but um, I guess part of the picture that's very hard to talk about in you know, this short time period is the complexity of the different flares we see. And so plotted in the on the right here is one of these where in the IR and the submillimeter, there's a clear time lag between the flares. And this time lag then would suggest that there's some form of adiabatically expanding synchrotron plasma. Um, uh, so we uh, then, based on these types of things, would think that there are classes of uh, emission mechanisms generating, the, generating these flares. And it's this area that axis can really transform things. And so for example, here, if we look at that Chandra flare, um, you can by eye see that they're in 100 second bins and there's maybe seven bins across that flare. Um, if we go to axis uh, for a simulation of a flare like this, right? We can get far more structure. And the question then is, is does that structure correlate with the structure we can see in the uh, infrared and the um, submillimeter? And this will be transformative. Uh, and I guess, yeah, the, the, the point to emphasize then is just about how a much of a multi-wavelength issue this will be and the types of things we need to think about will be with gravity, you know, 10 years time, but then the next generation ELT or EHT, the ELT will be, will be coming online, uh, Roman will be flying and how AXIS will um, work and operate with these instruments to carry out coordinated campaigns like uh, are needed here for Sagittarius A-star. Um, moving on to the larger flares, the larger flares are rarer, uh, Fundamentally more interesting because you get more photons, so you can see more interesting structure and potentially do more interesting things. Um, two of the brightest flares that have been seen have clear double peak structure to them. These, these were seen on separate occasions. Um, they sort of suggest that uh, there's time scales consistent with the ISCO involved. Um, a access to carry out this science, really our limiting factor will be a pileup. And with Chandra, many observations are, are have to be taken with the gradings inserted and in real subarray mode. 
And so this is a question then that we'll have to ask when we're doing access observations of the galactic center. Uh, do we have to think about uh, how often we observe the source with the telescope in a pile up mitigated mode? So perhaps with a smaller field of view. Um, more interesting things will be possible though, when we have more photons with an axis detection of a large flare. For example, with the large flares detected by Chandra, you can you know, carry out timing analysis and get hints of QPOs and things like that. Um, and again, I just wanna emphasize how important axis resolution will be. And so the cartoon here on the bottom is showing uh, the magnetar that went into outburst um, near Sagittarius A star, um, sort of around 2013-ish. Uh, and the flaring source then is Sagittarius A star flaring beside that. And so really um, arc second scale resolution is crucial to carry out this science. Uh, stepping away from Sagittarius A star, so there's sort of broader things we can do. Um, the molecular clouds near Sagittarius A star, they show signs of fluorescent emission. Um, considerations of time of flight arguments and uh, spectral fitting of this data, you know, gives us the uh, idea that past flaring activity of Sagittarius A star may have been the source uh, flux. Um, recently then, uh, quite excitingly, XP has come online and uh, they've just released some of their first observations of some of these molecular clouds and they measure statistically significant uh, polarization, uh, confirming this picture where past activity of Sagittarius A star um, is illumin illuminating these molecular clouds. And so again, with more effective area here, you're really going to be able to start carrying out, you know, a more nuanced echo mapping of these clouds to uh, determine previous temporal uh, variability from Sagittarius A star. Um, the point sources that are in this region will be compelling uh, for those of us who are interested in things like stellar mass black holes, neutron stars, CVs, pulsars. Um, we know that there's at least one magnetar very close to Sagittarius A star. There have been seven transient sources found very close to it. Um, there's many CVs. Um, the plot here is showing an interesting uh, proposal from a number of years ago, where theoretically you'd expect uh, stellar mass black holes to segregate and, and cluster towards the uh, central supermassive black hole where the potential is deepest. And so there was a claim that um, a number of the Chandra sources in this region have properties consistent with that. Now that's actually quite contentious, but it's something that Axis can really attack. And so theoretically, you can expect order hundreds of black hole LMXBs in this region. And really it's Axis studies identifying these and seeing the variability in uh, concert when multi-wavelength studies over time will allow us to answer questions like this. Um, so then what kind of things can access do and, and can it do it? Uh, so I'd, I'd also reference here talks by um, Arash and um, Oleg Kralsev, um in the last seminar series uh, where they presented similar types of simulations. Here looking at the um, galactic center itself, um, we have sort of a megasecond of ASSI uh, on the left and then about 100 kiloseconds of axis on the right. Um, and the punchline is then basically every point source that's detected by Chandra in a megasecond is uh, detected by Axis in about 100 kiloseconds. So you're getting at least a factor of 10 um, improvement there. And uh, the nature of the point sources here is um, their properties is somewhat simplified due to the nature of the simulation. And so gains better than that may, be, may indeed be possible. Um, again, I just wanna emphasize the sort of central nuclear region here and that Axis will be uh, clearly capable of uh, separating Sagittarius A star from nearby X-ray binaries 
and uh, the magnetar if it um, if it goes off. Um, okay, so I'll end then with just a, a couple of quick uh, references to the broader environment. I've shown this a little bit already. Uh, the plot on the left, on the right, we see the, the radio only image. Um, and I just want to show that radio only image really to show this image. And this is the sort of latest image produced by Meerkat. Um, and it's, uh, I think striking is the uh, word we would all use um, in particular with all these very narrow filamentary um, structures. But it's data like this that uh, will be the commensurate data sets with access if it flies. And so we have to think about then the uh, constraints that we can provide by combining the high spatial resolution radio data sets with uh, our X-ray um, imaging. And so sort of specifically with um, our galactic plane survey strategy, uh, we have a focus region in the uh, interior bulge uh, where we'll be um, uh, looking just above and below the plane. And you can see here that uh, much of the most interesting features in, say, that meerkat uh, image are contained uh, herein. Um, I, I just referenced then, you can see on the, mo the leftmost um, tile, that's the Sagittarius B star forming complex. And so there's multiple science areas going to be contained in this deeper exposure we're going to do here, but then a deeper again exposure on the galactic center itself. Um, so to end then, um, I guess I'll go back to Sagittarius A star and just uh, make two points that um, the gravity uh, interferometer has come online in recent years and they've started producing uh, some incredibly impressive results. Uh, this is uh, one of their discovery sort of flare observations of Sagittarius A star, where they observed uh, motion on the sky and the projection of that motion is consistent with plasma orbiting at something like seven gravitational radii um, around the black hole. Um, this is work that's going to improve over time. Um, and of course, we have the uh, EHT results, which have been released in recent years. Um, fundamentally, there's the science you get from the EHT image itself. But to understand this plasma, it's a multi-wavelength game. And so deep uh, multi-wavelength SEDs were taken at the same time as this data. And Chandra plays a crucial role here. As we move to um, you know, the 2030s, really with the improvement in instrumentation capabilities that are other wavelengths, we need an instrument like AXIS to do uh, the X-ray studies. And so for example, the thing in, for those of us in black hole land that's exciting is the next generation EHT project, their sort of design goal is to be able to take and create images on orbital timescales of for Sagittarius A star. The interesting timescale that has been proposed is about 30 minutes. And so you can essentially have orbit by orbit snapshots of the accretion flow configuration coming at coming to you from the submillimeter. So what will we be able to provide in the X-ray then? Because the flare mechanisms and the physics of the plasma, you require multi-wavelength observations to do this. And we need a high spatial resolution X-ray telescope to carry out these studies. Um, all right, so I'll end there and um, take questions. Okay, great. So th there's actually one question in the chat from Kenichi about what is the mechanism for flares? Um, the mechanism mechanisms, I, I would say, is proposed. So it's in, in broad families of uh, orbiting hotspots. And then these orbiting hotspots can, um, you know, expand. Um, or you're having some form of a uh, larger flow that starts to out that starts to outflow and expand itself, and so it's uh, in a sense, you know, there are sort of two classes of geometric models, um, and then the emission itself is uh, dependent upon, you know, if you're going for synchrotron only, or if you allow sort of scattering particle populations to be in there to give you synchrotron self-compton and things like this. 
So the data is allowing this broad parameter space of models to be um, viable right now. Okay, so so one other question was, how do you estimate the size of the Bondi radius of about five arc second? My recollection was that it was somewhat yeah, small. Yeah, um, the, the, well, um, we know the black hole mass, so we can sort of, um, you know, from our you know fiducial sort of Bondi uh, formulae, calculate where we think the Bondi radius will be. Um, so, you know, I think it's important perhaps to have a, a tilde there. So it's, we expect it to be somewhere between four to five arc seconds. And really probably the issue is with our deep Chandra data right now is that we're running out of photons as we uh, extend out to those radii that we can, you know, associate with a continuum from the Bondi region that we see interior to that. And so if you have a deeper exposure, that is a question that we can pot potentially observationally constrain. Can we see that emission cut off statistically and not just to just due to running out of photons? Right, right. Okay, so maybe I'll ask one question. Um, if anybody else wants to ask another question, uh, please raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, so, you know, I could definitely see how, you know, the much larger number of photons, you know, and being able to, you know, outside of sort of the central arc minute or two arc minutes get really high spatial resolution with axis being a big driver, but how also does the, you know, much increased sensitivity sort of above 7 keV that you get um, compared to Chandra, is, is that critical for any of these questions? Um, I think that 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 has interest for sort of the most absorbed sources um, and and the hard X-ray sources that are there. But potentially the, probably the most interesting area that Axis could contribute there is in studying the hottest plasma components in the ISM in the galactic center. And so these hot hottest components, of course, um, and it's resolving them. And, you can see them a little bit uh, in, in other facilities. Um, and the difficulty is to detect that hard ray flux, X-ray flux and say it's diffuse, you have to remove the uh, pulsars and other things from the field. And that's what Chandra or Axis would do. It will be able to identify where the hard X-ray sources are and then really constrain this hard X-ray um, emission. Okay, one so one one final question. Um, so Axis will also have you know a transient alert monitor where it can sort of trigger off existing observations. Do you do you think this would help with flare studies or monitoring of Sag A star, or are the flare durations like so short that they would all be within a few kiloseconds? I think they are uh, the time scale for flares is. 30 minutes is typically a good number to keep in right. mind. So sort of a couple right. of kiloseconds. Right. Um, so yeah, it's it's how much autonomy do you want to give um, such a precious detector, right? Because a flare from Sagittarius A star, the brightest flares that might be the most interesting thing to autonomously get the detector, say, to come down to a subarray on, uh, how quickly can you tell that that's not due to you know, a massive flare from a magnetar or something else that might um, do some damage to the CCD or something? It, I think they're the types of questions that have to be thought about. Um, and, and that's, a, that's a, deep, a deep strategy has to be thought about later on maybe for that. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um... Mary and Mark for great presentations. It was really 